Uh, right, welcome to the next um, part of our of the EU UK Forum's annual conference, first annual conference. Um, my name is John Peat. I'm the Brexit um, and Special Reports Editor at The Economist uh, in London. Uh, and it's a great privilege for me to be here and a, a, a particular privilege for me to be com in conversation with Jao Vali de Almeida, who I first met when he was the deputy press spokesman when I was in Brussels back in the 1990s, um, but he since then had a very distinguished career ambassador, EU ambassador to the United States, EU ambassador to the United Nations, and now the first EU ambassador to the UK. Um, uh, Zhao, uh, we've been hearing all morning about the relationship between the two sides being really quite difficult, quite bumpy, I think was the word that Lord Frost has used. Um, we heard Maros Sefcovic this morning saying that he used the word trust many times over with the implication being that there isn't very much trust between the two the two sides there have been troubles for exporters there was there's obviously trouble over the Northern Ireland protocol which we will we will return to what what do you make of the relationship now I mean we also had the row about your own position as ambassador do, do, do you think things are going to get better or get worse or uh, and how, how can we improve this well, uh, good, good morning or good afternoon, whatever, whatever you are. Thank you for, for the invitation. I want to praise Paul and his initiative of the EU UK Forum. I think uh, someone in the morning said that there is a sort of opposition between Brexit fatigue and, and the need for a strategic vision. Uh, uh, and I think I agree with that. And uh, the way to, gap, uh, to fill that gap uh, is also to engage uh, people like you, all of you uh, speakers in this conference, all of you listening to, to us today. I think uh, civil society, commentators, think tanks, uh, journalists, but also business people uh, uh, and otherwise elements of civil society must contribute to this, uh, to the quality of this uh, relationship. So where, where are we today? I, I think, uh, first of all, the jury is still out in terms of the perception of the effects of Brexit. It is clear that COVID has hidden uh, the effects of Brexit to a large extent, so I think we still need to wait a few months, if not a couple of years, to, to have a full assessment. And I think earlier points made in this conference go in the, in the, in the, same, uh, in the same direction. Uh, uh, what I see today is what uh, I would maybe call a, a post-traumatic stress. Uh, we come, uh, we are uh, living through uh, the first months after Brexit, let's be very clear. Uh, but uh, uh, we have behind uh, five years of uh, traumatic uh, experience. Uh, some call it a divorce, some call it other things. Uh, it's clear that it's been, it's been a difficult period and I think we, are, we need to overcome that. Uh, and, but for the moment we are in this period and we have to manage it. But my point, my main point, uh, uh, replying to your question, John, is to say we should not, um, we cannot allow this relationship, because it is an important one, we cannot allow this relationship to be hijacked by, by accidents, by, by flare-ups, by op-eds. We need to be able to manage it in a, in a, in a rational, uh, serene uh, way. Uh, and that's what we diplomats do, that's what uh, administrations do, that what, that's what we pay to do. So, this, in order to get better, uh, this relationship needs to uh, raise the levels of trust and lower the levels of drama. If we do that, I think we can be in a much better place when we meet again next year under, under Paul's auspices. Well, let's let's hope so. Um, does it? But but sort of pursuing that point a little bit um, now, d does it worry you a bit that you know when you read newspaper headlines here in in Britain, um, you know there's a lot of attacking the EU for its legal purism over the protocol, or for being too strict about um, uh, you know imposing constraints on fish exports and so on. That, that what's what's tending to happen here is that there is a lot of blaming the EU for everything 
going on in this country. Um, and indeed, it seems to actually benefit Boris Johnson that, you know, if he's in a confrontational relationship with the EU, it actually seems to win him support, support from the press, support from voters and so on. Uh, and, and what can you do about that? Well, I think we need to focus on, on finding solutions. I, I must say, uh, John, that I have my moments of doubt. Uh, you know, sometimes I wonder whether everyone wishes to, to find solutions uh, for the problems we have, or rather to prolong the problems we have, or even create new problems by, by raising uh, uh, expectations uh, to an, uh, you know, an unnecessary level, an unrealistic level. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I must say that I very quickly overcome these moments of doubt because I want to trust the word and the signature of, of everyone around the table. And uh, I move immediately to, to a solution, solution mode, to a constructive mode. Uh, and that's what we did, for instance, uh, uh, last week when, uh, uh, when Vice President Shevchkovic presented a package of measures that show that we care about the quality of this relationship, that we care uh, about uh, the life of citizens and businesses in Northern Ireland by presenting a package of measures that go a long way to address the problems that Brexit has created. And uh, focusing on solutions in a pragmatic, cooperative way is the best way to make this relationship uh, progress. Yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's, but it's, as you say, it's, it's not, it's not going to be particularly easy. And I wonder if you think also it's been made in, in a funny sort of way worse because Britain has done rather well on vaccines, and there's been a long sort of period of, of people saying, well, the reason Britain did well on vaccines is because of Brexit. You know, we got out of it, and the EU was hopeless at organising vaccines. There's a sort of triumphalism about vaccines here, which, which may make the relationship for a time more difficult. Yeah, this is not a zero-sum game relationship. I mean, one success in one side does not exclude success in the other. That's not the way we see it. We are very happy for the for the success uh, of any country, in particular our neighbours uh, regarding COVID. We'll never be safe if everyone is not safe. Uh, but uh, I said throughout these months that uh, fighting COVID is a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, you've seen you've seen what we've done in Europe. Uh, with an approach of solidarity and you see where we were you see where we are now and i think we need to be very humble about covid so i i follow the the discussion here i understand i saw earlier in your conference today uh, the european in polls uh, showing uh, clearly that the effect of vaccination success was a brief one that the public opinion has moved on. That, that is not my main concern to be very frank uh, I, I don't think this should be a beauty contest at all I think we are in this fight together against COVID as much as we are together fighting climate change, for instance. And, and, and my point, uh, John, is to say, and I think it's our responsibility, at least the way I see mine, is to try, is to, try to move on from the day-to-day -day management of these conflicts, which are to a large extent uh, the product of this post-traumatic uh, uh, period in which we uh, what we are into into a, a more strategic vision about our relationship and then i agree with those who say that there is a, a deficit of vision uh, i think we should dedicate more time to uh, think about reflect upon and and imagine what this relationship can be in the new context of post-brexit and i think that this is a criticism valid for both sides to be very frank uh, and it has maybe to do with brexit fatigue uh, but if I take my own leaders, uh, the European Union leaders meeting in European Council uh, and, and in different fora, uh, I mean, it's, it's not very helpful that every time they, they discuss the UK is to, is to address a situation where the UK has breached its own commitments and its own legal obligations. That's not the best way to sort of anchor a relationship. I would like to see us in a position in a few months uh, it, where we can discuss with the British leadership about about the future, about what we're going to do together. I saw that in uh, in Cornwall. I was at the G7 summit, and I saw the new dynamism in the G7. I think we should use that uh, uh, to to uh, sort of inspire us in our uh, relationship. We saw President Biden uh, changing uh, completely the approach of the United States. Um, and engaging in multilateralism, engaging in cooperation. 
without losing a, an ounce of the United States sovereignty. So I, I think there's scope here if there is goodwill, and I'm sure there is on both sides to invest in this relationship to do, to do better for the future. Okay, um, I think we, we, we will move on to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is perhaps the most controversial thing and the thing that Maros Sefcovic spoke about a lot this morning. But before we get there, just one more general question from me. You will have heard David Frost in particular, um, uh, and to some extent Boris Johnson himself, talking a lot about, you know, sovereignty, sovereignty being the, the main goal, the main aim, you know, that's what it's all about. You need to treat us as a sovereign equal, and they, they, they insist on the right to, for regulatory divergence. Um, what do you make of this sort of obsession with sovereignty? I mean, is Portugal a sovereign country? Is Switzerland a sovereign country? Um, what, do you, are you surprised by that obsession? Well, the, the EU is made of sovereign countries. Uh, we never challenge the sovereignty, the national sovereignty, and my country, Portugal, is very much a sovereign country, I can guarantee you. Uh, the, the problem with sovereignty or the, the context in which sovereignty is assessed these days in a globalized economy is a different one from from, uh, from earlier times. And, uh, and of course, uh, we could have a longer discussion about that. But my point uh, would be to say that we absolutely respect the UK sovereignty. We respect the decision uh, about Brexit. Uh, we regret it, of course, but we fully respect it. And let me give you a good example where we, the extent to which we uh, respect that and the extent to which we invest in this relationship. And that brings me to, to Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the first time in history that the European Union outsources the control of part of its external border to a third country, which is what the UK chose to be after Brexit. And uh, you know, can, can you can you can you imagine a, a a clearer and more affirmative way of recognizing uh, British sovereignty uh, by? In somehow outsourcing part of our sovereignty in the control of our border to a third country. I think this is very powerful in terms of statement about how much we invest in this relationship. Well, let's move on to the Northern Ireland Protocol then. Um, uh, I mean, as you will know, once again, um, Maros Sefcovic this morning suggested that part of the solution could be uh, temporary alignment for the UK with uh, EU SPS food and food safety standards, um, and um, but the British government has consistently rejected that approach. Um, do you think it's um, is it is it sensible to keep pushing pushing that idea when the British government has just repeatedly said no? Well, we've been uh, talking and engaging uh, thoroughly uh, and comprehensively with uh, Northern Ireland actors, political actors, civil society, industry. My first visit out of London. Uh, after my arrival was to Northern Ireland and uh, I hope that uh, we can return to Northern Ireland very soon uh, because we are absolutely committed to that. What do we hear in Northern Ireland? People want solutions for their problems. Mm -hmm. Our package of last week about uh, chilled meat, about medicines, about a number of other issues that are direct concern of citizens and business goes exactly in that direction. And what is the main idea that we hear there? With full support, wide support throughout the political spectrum, business, farmers, and beyond retail sectors as well, is the idea of a veterinary agreement. They all support it, regardless of their political affiliation or links to different uh, communities. So I think this is a powerful message coming from Northern Ireland itself about the the, the, the beauty of a solution of this kind, which will take away 80% of the controls, which would allow uh, UK authorities to build the infrastructures which are lagging behind in terms of facilitating controls uh, to allow, uh, for instance, whenever the controls are back, if ever we have an agreement and then we stop the agreement because the UK uh, would have changed its mind, the, the infrastructure will be there to allow these controls to, to operate in a smooth way in a quick way, without the negative impact uh, they, they have uh, today in, in, in business. So I see, I see the merits of, uh, of, of an, a deal, and the, the most important merit is that it is fully supported uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Yes, but unfortunately not in London. Um, but the tone of some still of the British minister's comments on this, I don't know if you've seen uh, David Frost and uh, David Frost's article in the in the Irish Times on, on Saturday. 
um, it, it was sort of quite an aggressive tone. You know, he was talking about the EU being legally pure, theological about everything, um, and and repeatedly in that article and in previous articles, um, he and other members of the government, including Brandon Lewis, have said, you know, we reserve the right to take unilateral action to 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 ameliorate the, situ the situation if we want to. Um, that is that is that a, that concerns you. I mean, we've seen unilateral action by the UK, and once again, David Frost in this article referred back to the EU's own near unilateral action in January over medicines and said that had been destroying a trust. I mean, they 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 don't seem to be in a very conciliatory mood. Well, uh, each one has to take its own responsibilities in what we do and what we say. I said earlier that I don't think we should allow this relationship to be hijacked by by accidents or flare-ups or opads, and I maintain that, and we will not engage in that. We are engaged in solutions. So we put forward a package last week that goes a long way. We are going to change our, we are ready to change our legislation on medicines to allow uh, uh, full supply of the medicines that Northern Ireland needs. Uh, this goes a long way in terms of uh, building trust and, and, and finding solutions for problems. And we only hope that the, the same attitude will, will, uh, will uh, be there on the, on the other side. And I have no reasons not to trust that. There is, there is in fact, a question from the audience, from uh, Rupert Wilkinson from the European Parliament Administrator. He's, he, he, he's, he wants to know, are you worried on the Northern Ireland Protocol that the British government will follow the European Research Group, that's the sort of Eurosceptics and the Tory party, of just constantly bagging concessions and then seeking ever more, and gradually undermining the entire Northern Ireland Protocol. I mean, there are quite a lot of Conservative MPs who just basically want to tear up the protocol, um, and they want to continue to extend grace periods almost forever. At, at some point, would, would, do you think the European Commission will have to be a bit tougher about this and, and, and maybe impose tariffs? Well, our expectation is that uh, both sides will uh, respect the commitments made. Uh, and these are not 30-year-old uh, agreements. These are agreements old a couple of years or even a few months, uh, at least being implemented uh, for, for a very short period of time. Uh, uh, the ink is hardly dry in, this, in these agreements for us to think about not respecting them. So I exclude that possibility uh, whenever the UK Make, takes any action that goes in that direction, we will have, we'll have to take legal action as we are pursuing legal action uh, against the UK. But we hope that we can focus and, and invest more in, in, in finding solutions against the, uh, again, the package last week goes in that, in that direction. But uh, as our leaders have said many times, and I said it myself, we don't exclude any option. Uh, depending on the, the, the behavior on the, on, the, on the British side. But again, I hope that we will not get to, to these uh, kind of uh, situations. I think Northern Ireland deserves better. Our relationship deserves better than that. And uh, we continue to be focused on solutions. And we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and one thing is for clear, when people discuss is Brexit done or not done? Well, it is uh, institutionally done, but it will be a living animal. You know, we will have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, my, my purpose, our purpose is to make sure that we do that in a serene way. So less drama, less politicization, less, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempts to score points on, on disputes of the past, but trying to build a, a, a future together because we are neighbors. We will not change the geography. We are allies. I'm sure we'll continue to be allies. We have strategic interest, common strategic interest. Uh, economic interest as well. Uh, I hope this will be a, 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 it will always be a complex relationship. Let's be clear about that. Uh, it will be more competitive than in the past, but competition is good. Uh, but I want it to be also a constructive uh, uh, relationship and not a destructive one. Uh, I can see that. Um, but some people here also suggest, uh, so let me put this suggestion to you, that the EU isn't always very good at handling relations with third countries in Europe. I mean, the Swiss have always been problematic and they've just recently broken off from um, negotiations with, uh, with, with, with Brussels. Um, Turkey, the relationship with Turkey is difficult. There is a suggestion sometimes that the EU just doesn't know how to handle non-members of the EU that are in Europe, or in some cases not in the not in the Euro. Do you think there's anything in that? I mean, does the EU need to have a a bit more tolerance of, of, of countries that choose not to be part of its organization? 
Yeah, uh, I think every country is unique. That's our approach. Even in our neighborhood, we have different kinds of relationships adapted to the different situations. And by definition, the UK is unique. It's the only country that left the European Union, and it's a major economy, major world global actor. So it's 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 quite it's obviously unique, and we have to find the right solutions. The negotiations were absolutely unique. We never did this before. I mentioned the control of our external border as a, as maybe the, the 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 most visible example of the uniqueness of this relationship but i believe this will always be an important relationship uh, and even if there is a degree of brexit fatigue uh, here and there uh, i and once uh, once the, the the effects of brexit become more visible i think everybody will realize the importance of all of us investing in the in this relationship so i i welcome you know this kind of events where we can go a little bit beyond the day-to-day -day management and try to see how we can, uh, how and where to uh, are we heading? Which actually brings me to another question from from the from the audience. Um, uh, Pierre Emmanuel Toman, um, how can how can the EU and the UK improve trust? Are there any specific areas that you think could help to improve trust? Um, I mean, I was thinking, could we do more on in the fields of foreign policy or security? Are there other areas where we might work together to improve the trust? Indeed. I, the first one that comes to mind, because it's also linked to the political calendar, is climate change, mm. where you have Glasgow COP26, uh, co-chaired by, by, by the UK, organized by the UK, but also with the help of Italy, uh, and uh, which is a, a critically important uh, uh, conference in the follow-up to the, to the Paris uh, Agreement. And uh, uh, we have a great deal of convergence with the UK, uh, and this is typically an area in which uh, we have much more in common than, than the, what separates us and uh, uh, where also the world needs us to cooperate. Foreign policy and security, I, I hear a lot of discussion about bilateral, community, whatever. I, I think there is room for bilateral cooperation between the UK and individual member states or even groups of member states. Uh, and there is room for a UK, EU, more formal uh, set of, of, of you know framework of, co of cooperation and i think uh, uh, you know time would tell and events will tell uh, the extent to which one needs to focus more on one or or the other but i think they are absolutely complementary if i see what we have been doing about uh, about china or about russia or about belarus uh, it goes in the direction of a great deal of convergence. The meeting of the G7 foreign ministers here in Lancaster House a couple of months ago was a good illustration of that. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm very pragmatic. I'm very realistic about, uh, about what we can do and cannot do. But I see a scope of cooperation on foreign policy and security, scope of cooperation in multilateralism. We just elected together uh, EU citizens uh, as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations uh, for a second mandate. All that goes, uh, what we need to do about the uh, reform of WTO and, and, uh, and uh, the World Health Organization, for instance, tells us a lot about, about the direction of our traveling and uh, areas in which we can uh, strengthen trust. So I hope that once we overcome this sort of post-traumatic situation, uh, in the in the in the months right after Brexit, we can we can come to to more serene waters where we can uh, clearly see uh, the benefit of cooperating uh, across well, the channel. Let's hope so. Um, we've got about five more minutes, and I'd just like to get one or two more audience questions in. Here's a very specific question from Rita Giannini Watson um, in Brussels. Um, who, who thinks that we have common interests in protecting the interests of EU and UK citizens and asks why is the EU blocking accession of the UK to the Lugano Convention, which protects access to justice for EU and UK consumers? Well, the Lugano Convention was uh, designed to uh, address uh, issues of member states. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an instrument that is conceived in that direction. Uh, there are alternatives to the Lugano Convention in the multilateral context, which are available to citizens and business in the UK. And you'd say something similar, I suppose, about the European arrest warrant. I mean, we have we have reached some kind of sort of accord on British participation in some aspects of, of, of justice, but not, it's not quite as good as it was. 
No, you know, you know, decisions have consequences. And as much as we respect the Brexit decision, as we do, uh, you know, Britain must realize the consequences of that decision. You know, a third country is not a member state. And that should be, uh, that should be clear. Uh, again, it was not our choice uh, uh, to, to have the, the UK out of the EU. But once it's done, it, 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 it carries consequences. Okay. And I, I can't resist asking you one question about where the EU goes now. Um, uh, because, of course, the departure of a large member state does make quite a difference to, to the EU. And we're also seeing at the same time um, the imminent departure of Angela Merkel as Chancellor of Germany. D do you think looking ahead, you know, this is going to strengthen the position, for example, of Emmanuel Macron as, as the most important leader in, in, in the European Union, assuming he wins re-election next year? Yeah, it's not without consequences, and I was saying that decisions have consequences. Brexit has also consequences for the European Union as such. It goes without saying. It's obvious if a, a country like Britain leaves, it has an impact. Uh, what I've seen so far, to be very frank, is uh, that I think that the EU has pretty well managed Brexit, Brexit in terms of if you look at the advances we were capable of making on defense and security, which maybe would have been more difficult to, to achieve if the UK was still a member. If I look at our reaction uh, to, to the, the COVID crisis, the next generation EU program, uh, which has been called an Hamiltonian moment for the history of the EU, um, would this have been possible with the UK uh, still part of the European Union? Some have doubts about that. I may share those doubts. So I think if I look at the public opinion support to the European Union following Brexit, and, uh, you know, I was posted in New York when I, I heard many ambassadors, colleague ambassadors in the large hall of the United Nations telling me, so who's the next country to leave the European Union? Uh, well, no one else left. And if I, if I trust public opinions, no one wants to leave uh, because uh, the levels of support to the public opinion have gone up instead of going down after, after Brexit. So overall, I think we managed quite well uh, the, the, the trauma of Brexit in, in the European Union. But it is, of course, a different European Union without the United Kingdom. How different it is, in what direction will it evolve? Uh, maybe in, the, in, in next year's annual conference, we can have a, a better view of things. Very interesting. Well, and we are nearly out of time, but actually, I think that that would be a good moment to ask one more question from the audience, from um, uh, Agato, Agati Gallo, from the uh, trainee in the European Parliament. Um, what would happen if the UK decided to apply to join again? Would it take a long time? Would 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 the member states say yes? We're we're very keen to have the UK back as a member, or do you think some people might say, well, actually, the UK is not a reliable country? Um, you know, the goal was right. Well, any good diplomat has one uh, one rule of thumb, uh, which is never comment on hypothetical scenarios. And I will be very, very disciplined in my reply. And I imagine you would say the same about the other aspect of that question I was going to ask you, which would be what would happen if an independent Scotland applied to join the European Union? Yeah, another hypothetical scenario I would not wish to comment upon, but you know, you know, you know how we deal with uh, with countries that want to join the European Union, and I'm sure same rules would apply uh, entirely if that hypothetical scenario uh, is confirmed, which is far from being the case today, of course. No, well, let's see. I think that's a very good moment at which to bring our, our discussion to an end. Um, I'd like to thank you, Jao, very much for, 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 for being here. Um, I, I also would like to thank Paul Adamson and his colleagues at the forum for having organized this conference and indeed for having founded the forum, which I think is a very useful um, and good idea. And I'd like to thank the audience. I didn't get every question you asked in, but I got most of them in. Um, so thank you very much. And Let me just add one point, John, because I, I've seen the list of participants or the potential list of participants. I've seen the speakers. I just want to sort of encourage all of you to continue to invest in this relationship. I, I think it's an important one for us. I'm sure it is for the UK. I guess it is also for the world. And your contribution, your inputs are extremely valuable to help all of us at different levels of responsibility manage this uh, relationship in the right direction. So all the best to the EU UK forum and for future discussions. And thank you for inviting me today. Thank you very much, Joe, um, and the best of luck. Thank um, you.
I think I am now supposed to say that we are breaking for lunch. I'm, unfortunately, since we're all virtual, we won't be given lunch, but um, I suppose we have a break of, I think, 40 minutes now before the next session comes. Um, so thank you very much indeed.